Senator Dizek. Mr. President, I move that the Senate do, I move that further proceedings under the roll call be dispensed with and the Sergeant in Arms be instructed to bring in the absent members. Members on that motion, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. no. The motion prevails. <laughs> members, will, will you be so kind as to stand? And as you know, we are going to say prayer. Today's chaplain is Reverend uh, Alfred Babington Johnson from Stair Step Foundation and His Works United in Minneapolis. Needless to say, following the prayer, please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's look to the Lord. Father, we thank you for your determination that these, your sons and daughters, would be gathered in this place to seek out your will and to serve your people. We pray, God, that you would continue to give them insight and understanding and clarity. Give them collaborative hearts that they might work together to accomplish your purposes. We believe you, O oh God, that in the midst of all the challenges of this season, that you will allow us to find our way to your truth and to that sacred service that will lift your people to a new place. We pray your blessing on all of these in this body. In the name of the Christ, we pray. Amen. 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 I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty. Thank you, members, for that prayer and for the Pledge of Allegiance. The secretary will take the roll. Abler, Anderson, Barr, Bolden, Carlson, Champion, Coleman, Swadzinski, Dames, Dibble, Dornick, Dreheim, Drazkowski, Duckworth, Diedzik, Eichhorn, Farnsworth, Fateh, Frentz, Green, Grunhagen, Gustafson, Hosschild, Herr, Hoffman, Housley, Howe, Jasinski, Johnson, Klein, Koran, Kroon, Kunesh, Kupek, Lang, Latz, Liskey, Limmer, Lucero, Mann, Marty, Matthews, May Quaid, McEwen, Miller, Mitchell, Mohammed, Morrison, Murphy, Nelson, Umuverbaten, Pappas, Pa, Port, Pratt, Putnam, Rarick, Rasmussen, Rest, Seeberger, Utke, Weber, Wiesenberg, Westland, Westrum, Wickland, Zhang. Members, pursuant to 14.1, Rule 14.1, the following members intend to vote under Rule 40. Point seven. Senator Mitchell, Woodbury, Minnesota. Senator Pa, Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Members, a quorum is present. With that being said, members, if you want to follow along, please look at your sen Senate agenda. We will start at the second order of business under executive and official communications. The following communications were received Please make note of no action is required. Now moving members to the fifth order of business, reports of committee. Senator Diesig to the motion to adopt the committee reports. Mr. President, I move that the committee reports printed in the agenda be adopted with the exception of the committee reports pertaining to appointments. Senator Diesick, a roll call vote? All right. So on that, on that adoption of, of the committee reports, I would have the, will all those in favor say aye? Those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Members, we will now move back to, to Senator Diesick for, for a motion pertaining to appointments to be laid on the table. Senator Dizik. Mr. President, I move the committee reports pertaining to appointments be laid on the table. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. <laughs> Members, we will now move to the sixth order of business, second reading of Senate bills. The secretary will read the Senate file numbers. Senate file numbers 285, 66, 611, 31, and 75. The Senate files have been given their second reading. 
Members, moving to the seventh order of business, second reading of House bills. The, the Secretary will read the House file numbers. House file number one. The House file has been given its second reading. Members, moving to the eighth order of business, introduction and reading of Senate bills. Today, the bills are listed on today's introduction calendar and are given their first reading and referred as indicated. As I usually say, members, if you go to the Senate bill's introduction, you can follow along. On page one, Senate file number 756, that bill has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. On page two, you will see Senate file number 758, and that bill has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. Senate file number 759, also on that same page, has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. If you go to page four, members, you will see Senate file number 780, and that's been referred to the Committee on Human Services. We will also go to page five. You will see Senate file number 792. That's been also referred to Human Services. And last but certainly not least, members, if you go to Senate file number 810, you'll see that bill has been referred to the Committee on Human Services. As I mentioned, uh, uh, members, that all those bills and everything that, that I said, said were just listed on today's introduction, and they are given their first reading and referred as indicated. <laughs> members, we are now on motions and resolutions. We will adopt the author's motions as one motion. All in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Putnam. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that Senate File 548 be withdrawn from the Committee on Capital Investment and re referred to the Committee on Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development. Member Senator Putnam moves that Senate File Number 548 be withdrawn from the Committee on Capital Investments and, re and re referred to the Committee on Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development. And I would naturally assume that this is your bill and you've talked to the other authors. Excuse me, the, the other uh, chairs? Yes, Mr. President. All right, on that motion, all those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. <laughs> Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. I've never made so many motions in my career. Um, and um, it's not with any levity that I, I do this. Um, and I'm about to make a motion to re refer Senate File 1. Uh, I have some new information that I learned last night, and that's the basis for this motion. And I'll make the motion that I'll describe uh, that information. Mr. President, I move to um, I move this House File One. Excuse me. Uh, now on General Orders, be stricken and re-refer to the Committee on Finance. Thank you, Senator Abler. Members, the the issue before the body is is, is Senator Abler moved that House File Number One. Now on General Orders be stricken and re-referred to the Committee on Finance. To specifically your motion, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President, to the new information. And I would like request a roll call, too, Mr. President. Roll call vote has been requested, and a roll call vote has been granted. Senator Abler, to your motion. Thanks, and it's, I'm not going to take very long, but it was almost a fluke. I was looking for a different reference last night, and I ran across the Medicaid statutes. And so we discussed yesterday that there's got to be a cost, because it's going to increase uh, the utilization, and then I found out, curiously enough, and I've given this uh, information to Senator Dietzik, uh, yourself, and to Senator Marty, just so it's not a trickery thing, but so people can be aware. There absolutely is a cost increase because of this. Uh, Minnesota uh, Medical Assistance covers abortions, but only related to the health of the mother and the life of the mother, uh, incest, and criminal activity. And it says only in the statute. Well, no, but and so, and but the bulk of the abortions, Mr. President, are done for elective reasons, according to the Department of Health. And so, if a person has a fundamental right to an abortion, then we're going to have to pay for that, Mr. President. There's there's another another example in the same set of law. Um, if you wanted a, to deliver 
at, but after, before 39 weeks in medical assistance, you may not. It's prohibited. But a person may decide it's their fundamental right to want to have a delivery on the 38th week. That would, we'd have to pay for that extra. And finally, uh, I called up CGIP this morning, and you might want to remember this, members might want to be aware. So if you want to get a vasectomy or get your tubes, whatever they do with those, um, you, they'll pay for that. But if you want to get it reversed, they do not pay. And so under a fundamental right, a state employee would now have a fundamental right to request a reversal of their sterilization. And Mr. President, that absolutely has a cost. And we can discuss it on the floor, but this is what belongs in a committee. And the Rule 4.4 reminds us that if something has a cost, it needs to go to finance. And so, Mr. President, I urge members to, uh, and I've asked both the chair of finance and the chair of my health committee, would you please get, request a fiscal note? And they both said no. I don't have standing to request it, Mr. President, or I would have. So I urge members to vote to send this back to Senate file to the, to the uh, Finance Committee so we actually can address this in the proper venue. Thank you. To the motion, Senator Aaron McQuaid. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and uh, members. Uh, Mr. President, I'm going to urge members to vote no on this motion, and if you'll just be kind with me for a second, I'm going to explain why. Um, Senator Abler did a very good job finding the statute where Medicaid uh, coverage for abortion is laid out and where the exceptions are. It is 256B.0625, and he is correct. Uh, the the ex circumstances that he explained are what the legislature passed into law. However, in 1995, there was a Minnesota Supreme Court case called Doe v. Gomez, where the Minnesota Supreme Court court found that statute to be unconstitutional. So if you scroll all the way down to the very bottom of that statute, it says, note, subdivision 16, which is where that's laid out, has been ruled unconstitutional. And further, the Minnesota Supreme Court has said that a person who is eligible for medical assistance and is considering an abortion cannot be coerced into choosing childbirth over abortion by legislated funding policy. And so in Minnesota, since 1995, medical assistance has already covered abortion care. And so there is no additional cost to the state for House File 1 or Senate File 1 because it does not change the circumstances under which we are paying for abortion in Minnesota. So I urge members to vote no. Thank you. Members, we are at uh, on their motion to re refer. Senator Abler moved that House file number one. Now on general orders. Uh, Senator Abler. Well, thank you, and I appreciate the Only enlightenment. Only to the motion, uh, Senator Abler. To the motion, and actually just to the substance of why. Um, so I appreciate the news about the, um, uh, the unconstitutionality of it. Um, but that doesn't change CGIP. How many times have we had to get a fiscal note because of CGIP? And Mr. President, Rule 4.4 does matter. And it doesn't say if it's a big cost or a little cost, if there's a fiscal impact. It's upon that basis that we need to find out for sure. And, and the, the place to debate this is not on the floor. We've discussed this in rules about how we could have had discussions uh, in, in proper committees, a little more time. But, Mr. President, but people have to vote to send this back. Or Rule 4.4 does not matter. And if you have a bill that has fiscal impact, it does not matter because you can just send it right to the floor. So please vote in favor of the motion. Thank you, Senator Abler. Senator Duckworth. To the motion only, with the motion to re-refer. Thank you, Mr. President. To the motion, uh, which involves the question of whether or not there's potentially a fiscal note involved with House File 1. Uh, this was brought up and debated yesterday, and there's been plenty of time for a member of uh, the DFL caucus, the chair of that respective committee, to go ahead and try to satisfy any concerns that have been raised by Senator Abler in regard to a fiscal note or in regard to a cost to the state of Minnesota. It's a very simple request. It's a very reasonable thing to do. I would argue it's our duty and responsibility to do so. And I'm willing to have somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that even after that point was raised yesterday, being raised against today, that that fiscal note or request for it was still not made. And the reason why I think we should be voting in favor of the motion that's before us brought by Senator Abler is one of the basic things that's our job here in the Senate is to understand if there's any fiscal implications or ramifications to the bills that we're passing. Are we just simply going to ignore that? It's obvious that the Democrat majority in the Senate has the ability to bring this bill before us. It's going to get voted on. All we're asking you to do is honor the basic and fundamental rules 
of this institution that exists for the betterment of the people of Minnesota so we can have those conversations, do our due diligence, and truly understand what it is we're voting on. I don't understand if a reasonable request has been made and there's reasonable suspicion that there might be some costs associated with this bill, that you, didn't, that you wouldn't just request a fiscal note. It's an easy thing to do. It's the right thing to do. It's incumbent upon you to do. When you took your oath to serve, it's not to just follow some of the rules. It's to follow all of them no matter how inconvenient they may be. Please vote yes on this reasonable request to find out what sort of fiscal implications might come with this bill. Thank Sen you. Thank you. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. So as I've been listening to this debate, I pulled out my rules book, 4.4, and I wanted to read it to make sure that I fully understand as I'm considering the motion before us. And as I read here, all bills appropriating money or obligating the state to pay or expend money or establishing a policy which to be effective will require expenditure of money. So there are three scenarios there, three scenarios. When referred to and reported by any other than the Committee on Finance must be referred before passage to the Committee on Finance. So Mr. President, when I was listening to the articulation from Senator May Quaid, it doesn't have any, the, the rule as I just read doesn't speak about any new monies, any more money, it's just bills appropriating money or obligating the state to pay or expend money or establishing a policy which to be effective will require expenditure of money. And as we've heard from Senator Abler and others, Mr. President, that is going to be the case with Senate File 1. And therefore, Mr. President, I would seek to, to uh, ask the Majority Leader a question if she would yield. Senator Dizek, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Lucero, Thank to you. the motion only. I want to keep it tight. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And every single word that's come out of my mouth on this point has been to the motion. So my question to the Majority Leader, Mr. President, is does this rule, do the rules matter? Because as I read here, as I'm considering the vote, I need to know if the rules of the Senate matter before I cast my vote. Senator Dizek, to the question. Yes. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. Fantastic. I'm glad the rules of the Senate matter. I'm glad that Rule 4.4 is very clear, and therefore, I look forward to everybody voting green to uphold the rules of the Senate. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Housley. Thank you, Mr. President. I was going to say pretty much what Senator Lucero said. Uh, since my time in the Senate, uh, the last 10 years, rules really do matter, and members could take out their book and look at uh, rule 4.4, and it says exactly what Senator Lucero said. A bill must be referred before passage to the Committee on Finance if there will be any expenditure of money. And this obviously does have an expenditure of money, uh, Senator Abler has told us. And, and to Senator Abler's point, this bill is going to pass, but let's follow the rules of the Senate and send it back to, to finance and then bring it back here to the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you so much. I think Senator Marty had his hand up, but it looks like he's talking, so go ahead, Senator Pratt. Well, thank you, Mr. President. As we had this discussion yesterday on the motion, Senator Marty made a, uh, a reference that the ranking member of the Finance Committee could, in fact, uh, request a fiscal note, and I would Correct, Senator Marty, in that uh, statute 3.98 limits specifically that only the ranking, only the chair of the standing committee and the chair of finance may request those fiscal notes. So, our request for the majority to request that fiscal note is not because we don't want to do it; it's because statute will not allow us to do it, and therefore, that, uh, I urge members to vote in favor of the motion. And let's get let's get the information all the information in front of the people of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Marty, to the motion, he has nothing. Uh, any other discussion? See, S Senator Abler is going to give us our last comments so we can vote on his wonderful motion to re-refer. 
Um, thank you, Mr. President. I think it is a wonderful motion. Um, I thank you to. Oh. And to the motion, Senator Day. I know. I'm just. I, I looked up the reference that Senator May Quaid cited, and it just keeps screwing up. Anyway, so it talked about. Um, it was struck down with regard to therapeutic abortions, and so. Mr. President, the floor of the House of the Senate is not the place to discuss what is a therapeutic abortion. But I will posit to you that um, did not want children at this time is not a therapeutic abortion, which are well over half. And so, Mr. President, uh, Senator May Quaid is correct. It was struck down, but only in part. This bill has a cost. As, a, as the owner, as the guider of the Senate, as the the overseer of the rules, Mr. President, you yourself must vote that this should go back and be discussed at the proper site. To not is actually just neglect. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, uh, the secretary will take the roll. And you're voting on the motion to re-refer. Senator Morrison, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Mr. President, I report a no for Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell votes no. And Mr. President, I report a no for Senator Pa. Senator Pa votes no. All those having voted who had a desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 31 ayes and 34 noes. The motion to re-refer is not adopted. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. Point of parliamentary inquiry. State your point. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I am just wondering if the rules of the Senate matter. Uh, Senator Lucero. All the rules of the Senate matter. The issue that was before the body has already been, de de has been debated. Uh, there's been an answer to that. And so, yes, the rules of the Senate matter. Thank you, uh, 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 Senator Lucero. Our now, uh, we are remaining under the order of business of motions and resolutions. Senator Desig to designate special orders. Mr. President, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills to be made special orders for immediate consideration. Members, the list is on your desk. Uh, members, the uh, first uh, special order bill is House File 37, number one, on general orders. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, members. Thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File number 44, which is also known as the Crown Act. The Crown Act stands for creating a, responsive, a respectful and open world for natural hair. This bill seeks to uh, ensure protection against discrimination based on race-based hairstyles by extending statutory protection to hair texture and protective styles such as braids, locks, twists in the workplace, and public schools. What we have seen, uh, we've seen continuous bias to, per uh, to perpetuate unfair scrutiny and discrimination against women and men inherent to culture. And this bill is about protecting a person's decision free from discrimination to wear their natural hair in the workplace and in school. 
So this bill simply adds a definition of, of race to the Minnesota Human Rights Act to explicitly protect natural hairstyles and textures, including but not limited to, as I mentioned, braids, locks, and twists. This will ensure that hair discrimination is legally included as a form of, discri of discrimination. Ultimately, the Crown Act brings clarity, and I, understand, I underline that, uh, members, clarity to the Minnesota Human Rights Act to ensure that no Minnesota now or in the future can be discriminated against because of their natural hair. So members, we, we know that study ha studies have shown, research has found that black women are 1.5 times more likely to be sent home from the workplace because of their hair. Black women as 80% more likely than white women to say that they, that they change their hair from its natural state to fit in at work. And research also shows that black women with natural hairstyles are perceived as less professional than black women with straightened hair. We recognize that any form of discrimination hurts an individual, and we want all individuals to be able to go to work and feel included and welcomed in the marketplace. So we are asking that you join me in passing the Crown Act as an important step towards eradicating racial prejudice and stigma regarding natural hair in Minnesota. Just so you know, members, there's roughly 14 U.S. states have passed provisions related to the Crown Act and therefore protect against race-based hair discrimination. So another uh, issue that I want to call your attention to, you have a number of letters that are on your desk, one in particular but not limited to, is from the Department of Labor and Industry. They've indicated that there are no issues as it relates to uh, labor laws. One will always have to follow labor laws. Another thing that I think is important for this body to know, this bill is not one that protects an individual if they want to have orange hair or blue hair. That's not what this bill is about. It's about natural hair. Last but certainly not least, it does not interfere with the military. Military rules and regulations will still have to be adhered to. I believe that by us collectively um, uh, joining me in supporting and passing this bill, it sends an important message so that all feel included here in the great state of Minnesota. So thank you so very much, members, and I stand for any questions, and I hope to get your support in passage of the Crown Act. Discussion on House File 37. Seeing none, uh, um, uh, Senator Wiesenberg. Wiesenberg, yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I believe that racism is not good and we shouldn't be, you know, being racist against people because of their hair. Uh, in my three weeks that I've been here, I have had emails from, I'm guessing, members of the opposite party telling me that I look ugly and I should shave my face and I should go back to Hickville. No, I don't think that's appropriate. I have a beard, it's my natural hair. So, so people should stop doing this and we should let people of all colors and all races know that we shouldn't be racist against hair. Uh, it says, race is inclusive of traits associated with the race, including but not limited to hair texture, hairstyles such as braids, locks, and twists. I would like to make an amendment to add beards onto line 1.9. Thank you. Further discussion on House File 37. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Senator Wiesenberg, would you repeat your oral amendment and then I'll ask the secretary to um, Th read it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would just like on line 1.9 just to add beards after twists. Thank you. Secretary will report the amendment. Senator Wiesenberg moves to amend House File Number 37 as follows. On page 1, line 9, before and insert Beards, comma. Discussion on the Excuse Wiesenberg me. Amendment, the oral amendment. Madam President. Um, Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Senator Wiesenberger, Wiesenberg, thank you so much for your um, uh, thoughts. Thank you so much for you understanding the, the importance of us having a uh, work free or workplace that's free of any discrimination. I would ask the body not to um, adopt the oral amendment at this particular time. 
One is because we have not had situations where a beard is something that has been problematic. Number two, um, as the research has, has shown us and found that black women are 1.5 times more likely to be sent home from a workplace because of their hair. And I would journey to say that uh, um, I don't think as many women would, would be wrestling with the issue of a beard. So with that being said, um, uh, with all due respect, and thank you so much, uh, Senator, I would ask for us to have a clean bill and not necessarily change it or change the complexity of what is being done here. Thank you so much. Senator Wiesenberg. Thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, Senator, uh, or Mr. President. Um, I would just like to request a roll call on this amendment. Thank you. Roll call will be granted. Senator Rarick. Well, thank you, Madam President. And um, would the author of the bill uh, be willing to yield to a question? Senator Champion, do you yield for a question? He does. Senator Rarick. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, this amendment brings up uh, basically the question that I was going to have for the bill in general, and it would apply for the amendment. Um, in construction especially, and I know out at the refineries, there are a lot of things because of safety and OSHA regulations for job-specific things. Uh, the beard in particular is, you, you can't have a beard out at the refinery because if you have to put a respiratory mask on, it would interfere with its operation. And I'm sure in a lot of construction and a lot of manufacturing, there are going to be some of those safety instances and OSHA regulations. And so I'm just wondering, in general, uh, is that taken account for in this bill so that this would not override any safety or OSHA regulations um, that would occur in especially manufacturing or construction? Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. And to Senator Rarick, Senator Rarick, this bill will not impede or interfere with any OSHA regulations. You'll also see on your desk that I provided a letter from the Department of Labor and Industry that speaks to that, speci that specific issue as well, so it does not. Um, Senator Howell. Thank you, Madam President. Would the uh, Senator Champion yield for a question? I'm sorry, I was distracted. Would, would you say Senator, again? would I Senator, will yield. Senator yeah. Champion, Yield for a question, Madam Senator President. Senator Champion, do you yield for a question? Yes. He does. Senator Howell. Thank you, Madam President. And Senator Champion, I, I know you, with uh, Senator Wiesenberg's amendment, you talked about the number of women being sent home because of their hair. My question to you is, does not this bill apply to all sexes? And so wouldn't that, I would have to believe, apply to everyone equally, this bill? Or is it just for women? Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you for the question. This bill applies to men and women. Absolutely. But issues surrounding beards has not been the problem. That is not what we are trying to correct at this particular time. And by the way, I do like Senator Wiesenberg's beard, by the way. So I just want the body to know that it is not discriminatory. It does nothing to make a difference between men and women. It is just that beards is not the, the issue before the, the body that we are attempting to deal with in real time. So I would ask the body to vote no on the oral amendment. Uh, Senator Howell on the Wiesenberg Amendment. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And my point is, is that I believe that if we're going to make this equal, and I do believe that there has been, and I know Senator Wiesenberg has had this issue, I would have to believe that we should be proactive in this piece and add the beard to prohibit that from happening. Because I do believe if we've seen, if this is a problem and we've seen discrimination because based on hair, uh, I would have to believe it's happened for beards also. So I stand in support of the Wiesenberg Amendment. Is there further discussion of the Wiesenberg Amendment? A roll call has been requested. Um, the secretary will take the roll. Did you change my thing?
I know, it's a roll call. I know, this is my button though, right? That's what I'm just asking. What? Members will please vote. Senator Morrison. Madam President, I report a no for Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell votes no. And Madam President, I report no for Senator Pa. Senator Pa votes no. Have all members voted who desire to vote? There being 35, uh, what? Sorry, uh, secretary will close the roll. There being 30 ayes and 35 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. Is there further discussion of House File 37? Seeing none, the secretary will give House File 37 its third reading. House File number 37. Further discussion? Senator Westrom. Madam President, uh, would the author yield, please? Uh, Senator Champion, do you yield? He does. Senator Westrom. Uh, Madam President, uh, Senator Champion, can you uh, explain to uh, us how this will be implemented uh, when you refer to the natural hair? Uh, does this restrict uh, employers, uh, maybe restaurant owners, or other uh, small businesses from requiring somebody to have their hair combed or maybe put up in a, uh, uh, a ponytail or some other uh, hair device if uh, if, it's, if their job is related to that, uh, maybe, maybe it's uh, their customer, uh, uh, greeting customers coming in and out and they have a certain look they want uh, their employees to, to have. Uh, they might be uh, in machine operators where uh, uh, long hair could get into uh, gears or pulleys uh, if, if they choose to do that. Uh, how far are we going down the road of saying uh, their natural hair has to be left in the state they want it in? Some people, uh, younger people, uh, sometimes uh, maybe don't brush their hair as often as others want to. Uh, uh, doesn't so, so, Senator Champion, are we going down the road where there can't be uh, uh, guidelines or expectations by uh, business, depending upon what it is, uh, on how people handle their natural hair? Uh, natural hair can go real long if you don't take care of it, and uh, is that is that going to be uh, forbidden now to uh, expect uh, certain looks or certain things to be done for safety or other reasons by an employer. If you can exp expand that or explain that to us, it would be helpful. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Westrom, for the question. Senator Westrom, first of all, I wanted to make sure that I redirect you back again to the letter provided to us by the Department of Labor and Industry. Um, nothing will be uh, undermined uh, around safety by uh, passage of this bill. Nothing. In fact, that's also repeated with the Department of Human Rights, who also talked about how this is uh, done. Uh, Senator Westrom, there's nothing wrong with saying you want everyone to be clean. Uh, as long as what you describe as being clean does not allow me to be in my natural state. For an example, if you say you want every person's hair combed and, and then you would think a person who has twists or locks or something like that constitutes someone not having a clean look. 
we believe that everyone should be clean and should be uh, respected as to who they are. And so there's nothing that would be arbitrary here, nothing that would be a challenge uh, to, in, to, to any particular person or business. Uh, and in fact, we have a number of businesses who also support the passage of the Crown Act. You will also see another letter from Children's Hospital, which is the CEO and others uh, like that. And then also a consortium that supports a number of businesses across our wonderful state who also supports it because they see the value in it and there would be no challenge and no problem at all. So thank you, Senator Western, for the question. But there are no problems here. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, wondering if the uh, author of the bill would yield. Senator Champion, he does. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, thank you for your yielding, um, uh, Senator Champion. So, Senator, um, we just had an amendment come before us to put beards on the bill as well. Uh, I'm struggling with thinking about this in the context of the bill. Um, I mean, the bill itself, Senator Champion, outlines different types of hair. It says braids, twists, and locks. Um, so, Senator Champion, is a beard hair as well, just like twists, locks, and braids are hair? Senator Champion. Madam President and Senator Jaskowski, thank you for the question because it allows me to further clarify it so that we have no challenges here. Beards is not attached to culture. Uh, and I love a beard. There are lots of bearded ones and I can't necessarily grow a beard. But I certainly appreciate those who have the ability to grow a beard. So, so, I, don't, so I don't see that as a challenge. Uh, and that hasn't been identified as a challenge that individuals ha have experienced. That's why we made this bill very narrow and we tried to tailor to the challenges that have been presented. Now, when I say that a beard is not a part of culture, that is not stated in, with any disrespect. That's not any disrespect. I'm trying to be as narrow as possible based on what has been seen and presented as a challenge. So thank you, uh, Senator Juskowski, and thank you, Madam President. Senator Juskowski. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Champion. Um, Senator Champion, I struggle with your definition of culture. Uh, would, would the author continue Senator to yield? Senator Juskowski, you do need to address your comments to the president, not directly to a member. Madam President, I struggle with Senator Champion's definition of culture. I'm wondering if you would continue to yield, Madam President. Senator Champion, do you yield? He does. Senator Juskowski. Thank you, Madam President. So, Senator Champion, have you ever seen the movie or the, uh, the TV series Duck Dynasty? Senator uh, Champion, you need to Madam President, uh, orally. <laughs> Senator uh, Jaskowski, I have seen Duck Dynasty, as well as I've listened to the music of ZZ Tops as well. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam President. Well, I'm, I'm encouraged, Madam President. Uh, the author has seen Duck Dynasty. Um, Madam President, members, Duck Dynasty represents people of a certain culture. And it appears that the author, in his definition, Madam President, doesn't consider that to be a culture, or at least doesn't believe that this bill should apply to that culture. And Madam President, members, Senator Champion, I would hope that we determine as we bring policy through the Minnesota legislature that it affects all cultures, not just particular ones, but all cultures. And indeed, Madam President, Senator Champion and members, Senator Wiesenberg's amendment, if any of these other pieces of the bill apply to prescribed cultures, and those aren't defined in the bill, and I guess it's open for interpretation or determination or uh, people's understanding or history or experiences in how those particular characteristics relate or don't relate to culture, Madam President. 
but I would hope that we do the same for all cultures and not just particular ones that we have in our experiences because it appears that this bill, Madam President, and the author's uh, response to my question suggests that there's only certain cultures that this bill addresses or applies to. We need members of Madam President this to apply to all cultures. And I think we just failed in, our, in the amendment decision that was made before this Senate. And we, we basically shunned out or disregarded a group of cultures that maybe many of us have not even considered yet in our discussion around this bill. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I rise because I was just truly struck by the chief author's uh, use of the word and that beards are not uh, part of culture. And I was struck by the, and I don't mean this derogatory, but ignorance. Because there are many cultures, the beards are clearly part and integral. Madam President, I've been to Israel twice and have also been a student of the Old Testament scripture. Beards are absolutely associated with the Jewish culture. Also, Madam President, I don't know if you're aware or if the chief author is aware. Uh, I've mentioned it many times in the other body when I was a, a former member that my wife is from Pakistan and I was married in a mosque. And I can tell you as part of Islam, beards are very much part of the culture. So to stand here on this body and say that beards are not related to culture is amazing, amazing. Madam President, I would draw the attention here and I'm wondering if the chief author might be confusing the word culture with some other word, ethnicity, nationality, etc. but culture just did a quick look up. The customs, arts, social institutions, and achievements of a particular nation, people, or other social group. So a culture can be part of a social group. And we know that Southern United States has different traditions than we do here in Minnesota. That would be their cultural aspects. So, Madam Speaker, I'm not uh, uh, rising for any other reason than to correct the false notion that beards are not associated with culture. Thank you. Senator May Quaid. Uh, thank you, Madam President. And I, I rise to thank Senator Champion for bringing this bill. Um, beards are not a racial trait. They are absolutely a cultural trait, but they are not a racial trait. I can't grow a beard, but I can grow natural curly hair. And um, being a black woman who has a white mom has been a really interesting journey for me as a black woman in Minnesota. She didn't know how to do my hair when I was growing up. We didn't even know my hair was curly. It was just big. It was outside the picture frame, actually, when I took my picture in fourth grade. And I remember learning how to do my hair. I remember sitting in salons on Saturdays and sitting with my auntie and having my, braid, my hair braided for the first time. I'm very, very tender-headed, unlike my cousins. And I grew pride around my natural hair. And I learned how to wear it curly. I started going to professional work. And I remember the very first um, performance review I had at a professional office was great enthusiasm love your input in meetings. Your hair, though, it's a little bit unprofessional. You might consider doing something about that. And I was like, OK. And I cried back at my desk, because it's just how my hair grows. And even though I'm a 36-year-old woman who knows that the hair that grows out of my head is wonderful and beautiful, and I hope to teach that to my daughter, whatever texture her hair is, um, it still sits with me, hearing that supervisor tell me that I might want to do something about my hair, because it's not professional. And to this day, members in this chamber and people watching on TV, you usually see me with straight hair, because 
I carry that in me. It's really, really hard when you are a public person to not hear in the back of your head someone telling you that the way that your hair goes out of your head is unprofessional. And you might want to do something about it. And so I thank Senator Champion for bringing this bill because there are people across the state and across this country who are discriminated against for the way that their hair goes out of their head, for the way that they style their hair. There's a rich tradition in the black community. They used to actually braid hair to map out the Underground Railroad so they know where to go and where to stop. I mean, it's a beautiful tradition. And in the year 2023, I'm, I'm glad we are here, but I can't believe it took us this long to acknowledge that the way that our hair grows out of our head um, is not bad. It is good, it is natural, it is beautiful. And this amendment gets us one step closer to telling every person, including little black, brown, and girls and boys with afros, that they are wonderful exactly how they are. So I want to thank Senator Champion for bringing this bill, and I encourage a yes vote. Remind members, we uh, are on third reading at this point. Uh, Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam President. I um, wonder if the author would yield again, Madam President. Senator Champion, do you yield? He does. Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam President. Um, thank you, Senator Champion. So, Senator Champion, um, are you are you familiar with the Amish culture? And and if you would tell us, you know, what you know about them and uh, how that relates to the bill. I'm I'm particularly still troubled about the fact that we are excluding beards from this because I think this is as fundamental to the bill as any parts of the original language in the bill. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Draskowski, for the question. I'd like to make sure that individuals are very clear as to what I'm saying. Do I believe that other cultures embrace the notion of beards? Absolutely. You've talked about some of those. Those I embrace and understand. So if there was a misunderstanding there as it pertains to culture, please understand exactly what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to in this context is just that when we look at race, associated in this bill, not limited to hair texture and hairstyles and braids, locks, and twists. I'm not excluding anyone else. And in fact, I'm open to, not in this bill, but if there's a bill in the future that someone believes that it's a correct or wrong, we certainly should do that then. I'm also saying that here in this context, we have not received any complaints around beards. That is, that is not to suggest that they are not there, but we haven't received any, and I tried to be as narrow as possible in order to address an issue before this body. So when you think in terms of the Amish, I know that it's a religion and a faith, and those are the things that I know about it. I embrace and support all religions, Jewish and otherwise. So I don't want us to be derailed by some of the comments that are being made, I just believe that this particular bill should respond to what we've heard as far as complaints are concerned, and in the event a member of this body, and especially you, Senator, M Madam President, especially Senator Jaskowski, if he believes that there's something that we can do later, I'm happy to continue to engage him and, and any other member of this body, because I try to work across the aisles in order to address issues. Senator Dr Driskowski. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Champion. Well, well, Senator, you had the opportunity to do that and work across the aisle, work across cultures uh, in the amendment that was offered, and you voted no. He voted no, Madam President. Uh, that doesn't seem to be congruent with what the effort is here. The effort is here to, to form out a bill that is is going to be in the public interest, regardless, Madam President, of the culture or the race. The attachment that beards in the Amish culture have and their, uh, how do I say it best? Madam President, I only know of one race that has been in the Amish culture, and that is being singled out here and not included. And that's not the spirit or intention of this bill. I'm certain of it. But Madam President, members, 
We made a grave mistake with Representative Wiesenberg's amendment, and we can correct it here today. Uh, Madam President, I would move to reconsider third reading. Senator Draskowski has moved to reconsider third reading. Um, Senator Dietzik. Senator Champion. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Madam President. It's my understanding whenever you're going to reconsider something, the person has to be on the prevailing side. And it's, and it's my understanding Senator Juskowski was not and did not vote on the prevailing side. Senator Champion, actually, we did Mr. not take Madam a President. vote. We did not take a vote on, um, at the point of declaring that third reading had happened. Um, so we have a motion. Um, Senator Frentz. Yes, Madam President. Just one moment, please, Madam President. Madam President, point of parliamentary inquiry. Senator Lucero. Thank you. I'm just wondering if you can make it very clear that third reading was not a motion that was voted upon for the body here, that it's not something that there, you can't be on a prevailing side. Yeah. Uh, Senator Lucero, there was, as I said, there was no vote on third reading, so anyone can move uh, to uh, reconsider third reading. Uh, Senator Hoffman, are you on the floor? Madam President, roll call. Thank you. It was harder than it should have been. Uh, a roll call has been requested on the motion to reconsider third reading. The secretary will take the roll. Senator Morrison. Senator Morrison. Madam President, I report a no for Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell votes no. Madam President, I report a no for Senator Pa. Senator Pa votes no.
All members having voted who desire to vote the motion to reconsider third reading. I'm sorry, I forgot that again. Uh, Secretary, close the roll. All members having voted who desire to vote the motion to reconsider third reading of House File 37 um, does not prevail. Further discussion on uh, House File 37. Seeing none, uh, the uh, Secretary will take the roll on final passage. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Madam President. I report an aye for Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell votes aye. And Madam President, I report aye for Senator Pa. Senator Pa votes aye. There being um, all Senator. Secretary will close the roll. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary has closed the roll. And there being 45 ayes and 19 nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. The next bill on special orders is number 13, number four on general orders. Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Members. My hope is that this one would not take as long as the last one. <laughs> no, thank you for your support. Senator, senators, before you is Senate File 13. It is affectionately known as the Juneteenth Day. It, it is a day to reflect on history and work forward with purpose. And Senate File uh, number 13 is intended for this stated purpose. Just so you know, historically, those who were free from bondage celebrated their long overdue emancipation on June 19th. Today, our state and nation should commemorate Juneteenth, a chance to celebrate human freedom, reflect on the grievous and ongoing legacy of slavery, and rededicate ourselves to rooting out the systemic racism that continues to plague our society as we strive to deliver the full promise of America to every American. This Juneteenth, we are and should be uh, freshly reminded that Juneteenth is a day to reflect on both bondage and freedom, a day of both pain and purpose. It is, in equal measure, a remembrance of both the long, hard night of slavery and subjugation, as well as a celebration of the promise of a brighter morning to come. My hope is that Juneteenth, with your support today, will be a holiday that we remember our extraordinary capacity to heal, to hope, and to emerge from our worst moments as a stronger, freer, and more just state and nation. It is also a day to remember the power and resi resilience of black Americans who have endured generations of oppression in the ongoing journey towards equal justice, equal dignity, equal rights, and equal opportunity in America. I prefer for the governor to sign a bipartisan piece of legislation establishing Juneteenth as our newest state holiday so all Americans can feel the power of this day, learn from our history, celebrate our progress, and recognize and engage in the work that continues. 
Great nations do not ignore their most painful moments. They face them. We grow stronger as a country and as a state when we honestly confront our past injustices, including, including the profound suffering and injustice wrought by slavery and generations of segregation and discrimination against black Americans. But it is also an opportunity to show that we are moving towards healing. And to heal, we must remember. We must never rest up until the promise of our nation's promises as exercised through states are made real for all Americans. The Emancipation Proclamation or the Emancipation of Enslaved Black Americans was not the end of our nation's work to deliver the promise of equality. It was only the beginning. With a state-recognized Juneteenth holiday, we recommit ourselves to our shared work to ensure racial justice, equity, and equality. We commemorate the centuries of struggles led by everyday Americans who brought our nation closer to fulfilling its promise. The late Congressman Elijah Cummings said, our children are the most living messengers we send to a future we may never see. I often remind people that I was born and raised in Minnesota. My parents left the South for Minnesota, and throughout my upbringing, we've always recognized Juneteenth and focused not only on the pain, but on our collective collective work together for progress. Now we stand in this moment, members together, as members of the Senate to pass legislation to make Juneteenth a holiday and promote the notion to build a state and country that we are all proud to pass along to our children. One where the foundational promises and ideas of America ring true for every child and every family. Members, this is an opportunity and I hope that you will support this uh, legislation to, to celebrate Juneteenth or to identify as a state holiday. Just so the, that you also know there's no cost related to it um, as the contracts were negotiated with MMB already that recognizes this in state contracts. You have a letter on your desk um, from uh, uh, MMB outlining that, but we also have a letter from a number of different people that says this, that it's time for us to do this together. So members, I look forward to any questions that you might have, and I hope that you will join me in putting up a green vote to recognize Juneteenth as a state holiday. Thank you, Madam President, and I'll stand for any questions. Discussion on Senate File 13. Senator Toskowski. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Champion, for bringing this bill. Um, we had a good, robust discussion about components of it in the State Government Committee. Um, I'm wondering, uh, Madam President, if the author would yield for questions. Senator Champion, do you yield? He does. Senator Driskowski. Thank you, Madam President. Um, so Senator Champion, uh, we talked in the State Government Finance Committee and uh, you gave a compelling discussion about why we don't have a fiscal note for this bill. and. Um, and certainly there could be a level of argument over that even yet. We talked about that and, um, and you know, I think uh, uh, your interpretation of it prevailed and probably is the right one. But what we didn't talk about in the state government finance and, and local government committee was, and, and Madam President, we were talking about the fiscal impact of this bill. And, uh, and I will, uh, Senator Champion, mention that uh, I do like the spirit of the bill and what it wants to accomplish that you so articulated well. Uh, but Senator Champion, what I struggle with is the unidentified and uh, uh, unfunded mandates that this bill is going to bring to government. And we talked about that, but we didn't talk, Senator Champion, about the local governments and the unfunded mandate on local governments this spring. So I would ask you, Senator Champion, how many counties, cities, school districts, courts, uh, townships, and other municipalities are currently recognizing June 19th and giving their employees the day off? Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you to Senator Jaskowski, as usual, for asking me really good questions, and I did appreciate our conversation um, after the committee. 
Um, first of all, you'll see in your package members a note or a letter from MMB articulating that there's no fiscal cost because these, uh, this day was already negotiated in the contracts for state employees. Secondly, I'd like for this body to remember that the federal government already identified Juneteenth as a federal holiday as well. As it pertains to school districts, you recognize that June 19th is when school districts are out of school. So the kids uh, are not in school and others are not working on that particular day. We are not putting forth an unfunded mandate for private employers. We would hope that they would recognize Juneteenth as a day, but that's something that they would have to decide upon. And so when we think in terms of the number of other counties, and because we know we got 87 counties and other cities, I don't know what that number is for them, but this, is, will, this will be a recognized state holiday. Here's the last thing that I'll say, uh, members. We at the Senate recognized Juneteenth because we gave our employees and our staff the day off because we recognized Juneteenth. And it is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. Because what I recognize is, is not just about history and looking back, but it's about celebrating as well the work that we have ahead of us that we must do together and we should do together. And as I mentioned in my opening comments, is that great nations don't ignore things. They look forward, and they look forward to opportunities to work together, to build together, because black history is American history. And I just hope that we all will understand that. And so, Senator Jaskowski, I'm not sure of the other counties and the other things that they've done, but this bill is really limited, and we understand what our um, costs are. And as you remember, Senator, we also went from state and local governments committee to education, and we went through all the necessary committees in order to make sure that we're here today. Thank you. Senator Truskowski. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Champion. Well, Madam President, uh, I understand and appreciate deeply what Senator Champion wants to accomplish with the bill. I think the augmentation of our understanding of our history and the augmentation to our culture going forward as a state is a good thing. But what we are seeing here, members, is bills moving through this legislature at lightning speed. They are being forced, they are being pushed, they are being sped through without the due diligence that we need to do as a legislature. As a matter of fact, Madam President, I've I put together a, my short back of the napkin compilation of the number of municipalities that we're not considering with this. And I will preface that, Madam President, uh, that I understand Senator Champion's uh, discussion around the fiscal impact. Members, our fiscal notes uh, represent the impact on state government. There's about 35,000 state employees in the state of Minnesota. That is a state executive uh, departments, uh, the executive branches agencies. That's what it includes, the 35,000 employees of our uh, executive branch. But a fiscal note does not include, doesn't, Madam President, even begin to contemplate what this particular bill or any other bill that we bring forward would have on local units of government. And traditionally, we do a local impact note. Now, that takes time, Madam President, but apparently the majority didn't want to wait for a local impact note as they forced this bill through at lightning speed without the level of contemplation that a, that a good legislature should do. Madam President, that's lazy legislating. And if we are going to do our due diligence to the people of Minnesota, we would take into consideration truly the impacts that it would have. Now, Madam President, I put together my compilation. we got 87 counties in the state of Minnesota. Um, I'll preface that, Madam President. I texted before this bill came up here today three people, one person on a county board, one person on a, uh, one superintendent and one city manager in the state of Minnesota. They're in my district. I asked them, do you celebrate, currently celebrate and give employees the day off 
for Juneteenth in your, in your local jurisdiction? The answer all three times was no. So, Madam President, we don't understand the full impact of this bill. And we haven't had that information brought for us, forward before us. 87 counties, 852 cities in the state of Minnesota, 331 school districts, Madam President, 331. That's not the number of employees. That's the number of school districts. And Madam President, I'll point out, school districts are, are impacted when school's not in session. There's a good number of employees that are working full-time uh, around the year or part-time around the year, and it impacts uh, those school districts in that way. The courts are impacted by this, Madam President. They haven't been contemplated or uh, the impacts uh, to them and the taxpayers uh, about giving another day off. Yet another day off there has not been contemplated either. 1,780 townships in the state of Minnesota, Madam President. You add up my back of the napkin math, that's 3,050 local units of government, and it doesn't even include all of them yet. And I don't know how many employees that is, Madam President, but this bill has not addressed or contemplated in the discussion we've had because it had to be ripped through here in lightning speed in order to accomplish, there's another bill scheduled for tomorrow, lightning speed, and I'm sure there's a bunch behind that. This has significantly impacted our understanding of the bill, our understanding of the unfunded mandates that this bill and our decisions are, con are casting onto the people of Minnesota, the property tax implications, Madam President, of this bill are huge. And this body, in its zeal to zip this thing through, kind of skipped that. I don't know how much it is. It's, it's, likely, it's likely tens of millions or more dollars, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, that this bill has an impact on our local units of government and we are just going to wing it through here. Madam President, members, we have to do better than this. This is a good idea. I mean, I, I, and I, I, would, I had asked the, the author to yield again, but I won't. We could, we, could, we could strike one of the current holidays or strike the day after Thanksgiving in current law and put this in there and accomplish both. But there's not time for that, Madam President. The majority here in the legislature is set on forcing through an agenda so quickly that we cannot properly contemplate and do the things we need to do for the people that sent us here. Thank you, Madam President. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam President. And I am wondering if the chief author would yield for a question. Senator Champion, do you yield? He does. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you, Senator Champion, for yielding. So I did hear your remarks that the contracts have already been negotiated that include this and recognize this as a state holiday. My question is, when I'm reading the letter, I did pull out the letter, so thank you for drawing our attention to the letter from MMB. But I don't see in here confirmation that the contracts have been ratified. So as we know, uh, there are negotiations that take place. Contracts need to come before the legislature uh, to be ratified uh, and accepted. So I'm wondering, uh, Madam President, my question for the, the bill author is, the contracts that have been negotiated, have they been approved by the legislature? Senator Champion. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Yes. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam President. And then my question is, can, if you would yield again for a question. Senator Champion, do you yield? He does. Senator, 
Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam President. So then, uh, could you also just let the body know when uh, was this first negotiated for historical purposes? How far back, how many contracts has this been uh, part of the um, recognized holiday? Senator Champion. Madam President, Senator Lucero, I don't know the answer to that question, Senator. Senator Lucero. Okay, thank you, Madam President. So I look at the rules here, and even if it's been negotiated, and I'm, I, I'm not certain it's been ratified, but I do understand the bill author did say that. He did say it has been, so I'll just take his word for that. But when I look at Rule 4.4, .4, which this body, Madam President, did uh, look at earlier, and by the way, I would say my comments here, I, I very much agree with Senator Dreskowski in that I think the, the merits of the bill are, are certainly admirable. But I am one who wants to follow the rules. I believe rules mean things. And when I look at Rule 4.4, .4, as I read earlier, and I'll read a portion of it again, Madam, Chair, uh, Madam President, all bills appropriating money or obligating the state to pay money, to pay or expend money, or establishing a policy which to be effective will require expenditure of money. When I read that, it appears to me the plain reading is that this has to go to the Finance Committee. And as we've heard part of the discussion here, we don't know what the cost will be to the state. It may have been negotiated as part of a state contract. True. But it hasn't been a statute that we've passed as this body. And as the bill that we're debating here, this would be passing new language, which would be, per Rule 4.4, .4, establishing a policy which, to be effective, would require expenditure of money. Again, I'm not speaking to the merits of the bill, certainly admirable, but I want to cast my vote when I have full knowledge, when I have full information before deciding my vote. And for that reason, Madam President, I would like to invoke Rule 4.4 .4 so I can go to the Finance Committee, so we can get a fiscal note, so we can have full knowledge of the cost to the State of Minnesota. And Madam President, I would ask for a roll call on that. Senator Lucero, um, the bill has been to finance and dealt with there already. So Madam I'm President, I'm calling you to comment more. I'm waiting for you to recognize me, yes. I'm sorry, say I, again? I'm waiting for you to recognize me so I could speak. Oh, I did, yes. I'm Thank you, Madam President. right at you. Yes. Th thank you, Madam President. So then on that note, uh, if it has been to the Finance Committee, I have not seen this bill. So I apologize for my lack of information on this bill. I do know that the chief author just had mentioned it went through uh, education. I did confer with one of my colleague members of the Education Finance Committee. I have not seen it on the Education Finance Committee. That's why I don't know what the cost is. So if it has been to finance, then perhaps uh, Senator Marty would yield for a question just uh, if he's willing, be able to answer how, what is the fiscal cost then to the state. Um, Senator Lucero, Senator Marty does not appear to be present on the floor. Okay, well, I guess I won't be able to know then what the fiscal cost is. So at that point, I guess we're left, Madam President, uh, having a bill before us that is certainly going to have a fiscal impact to the state without knowing what that cost will be. Is there further discussion on Senate File 13? Seeing none, the, I'm sorry, Senator Lemmer. Thank you, Madam President. I've been listening carefully to our discussion. I've been here and a member of the Republican Party for quite a few number of years. I'm kind of proud of our first president, Abraham Lincoln and the work, the lifetime work that he did regarding the issue of slavery. The Juneteenth date to be recognized by state and federal governments 
county governments, every government in the country should recognize June 19th, Juneteenth, as a holiday. When we really pause and think of the history that slavery condemned people to, and the, and the, the purpose of the Civil War, and the 600 to 800,000 Americans that lost their lives, slavery was an important issue in that struggle. This is a time that we can recognize this date. I personally think it's long overdue, and I think we should vote for it. I want to thank Senator Champion for bringing it forward. It's been before us for a couple years, and due to a number of uh, disputes, not necessarily about that issue, but a variety of other uh, issues in our negotiations, we never got the job done. So I think this is an appropriate time to vote in favor of this bill, and it recognizes the struggle, uh, not only the civil rights struggle, but the struggle that this nation has long had up to that point. There was no surprise why a former Confederate state didn't tell those that were in bondage that slavery had ended due to the Emancipation Proclamation. So Madam President, I speak in favor of this bill. Thank you. Senate File 13, it's third reading. Senate file number 13. The Secretary will take the roll on final passage. I call on Senator Morrison to report the votes of those voting remotely. Senator Morrison. Madam President, I report an aye vote for Senator Mitchell. Senator Mitchell votes aye. Madam President, I report an aye vote for Senator Pa. Senator Pa votes aye. All members having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 57 ayes and eight nays, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. Pursued, proceeding now to uh, the 13th order of business, announcements of Senate interest. Uh, without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session, um, Senator Kroon and Senator Weber. Uh, Senator Klein. Madam President, announcement of Senate interest, the Commerce Committee will meet 10 minutes after adjournment in G15. Any other announcements of Senate interest? Senator Port. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, housing will meet 15 minutes after adjournment. Thank you. Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, the Committee on State and Local Government and Veterans will meet immediately upon adjournment. Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the Senate do now adjourn until tomorrow, Friday, January 27th at 10.30 a.m. On the motion, all those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails and the Senate is adjourned.